Hello. We are going to talk about different project types in project portfolio management and their different planning horizons. Okay. We start uh, by looking at the picture uh, that is adapted from uh, uh, Christoph Locke's uh, article uh, from 2000. And there uh, he describes the portfolio of uh, a European technology manufacturer company. And uh, in this picture there are portfolios or development projects or actually uh, development projects uh, marked as bubbles and the number in each bubble uh, indicates how many projects uh, there are in that area, in that bubble. And uh, uh, Christoph Locke uh, also in his article he called uh, these uh, projects as businesses and therefore the title also of this picture is business portfolio of an European technology manufacturer. So it is a po project portfolio but because all these projects are uh, developing certain new businesses uh, so that's why uh, they are considered as businesses themselves. Okay well uh, he analyzed uh, altogether uh, 90 po projects. There were 90 development projects uh, uh, in that uh, organization, but uh, he couldn't get information from all of them. So uh, in these two portfolio pictures, the numbers in each doesn't count up to 90 if, if you calculate uh, uh, the numbers from those bubbles. But uh, uh, basically, ideally, if we would have uh, information from all projects, so the left uh, the picture from the left would in, include 90 projects and the picture uh, in the right would include uh, the same 90 uh, projects uh, altogether. Well, um, the picture um, in the left explains uh, the market position before the project. So whether the market position is weak, uh, tenable and so on. Uh, or even dominant where the project is going to contribute. And uh, then the uh, uh, horizontal axis uh, 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 illustrates the market growth, uh, indicates the market growth uh, of that target market, uh, market where the project is going to develop either new pro uh, products or or new um, uh, solutions. Then um, if you look at uh, the picture to the right, so um, there were uh, strategic uh, positioning clusters. The projects were either incremental, which means uh, that uh, the renewal of the product or the market in that project was rather low. Or line extensions, which means that uh, the project targeted to new market, but uh, the change or re renewal of the product was uh, not very uh, significant. So it was based on rather small uh, incremental change of the existing product. Or then uh, radical projects which were uh, directed to new markets with new products. Okay, and then there was uh, in the right, uh, picture right there is the uh, horizontal axis uh, describes the target market profitability, ROS, which means return, return on sales. Well, uh, Locke uh, 
argue that uh, the portfolio of this firm was rather weak. And uh, where would he base this argumentation? First of all, there were rather big number of incremental projects and not very many radical projects which would take uh, the company's uh, products or markets to something new and promising. So the company was more or less focusing on uh, nibbling with uh, existing products and markets and uh, providing services for existing uh, customers. Also, uh, when they had few radical projects, not very many of them were uh, targeted to uh, high target market profitability. And if we look at the picture to the left, so not very many projects uh, were um, targeted to very high market growth. Those two projects in the picture left, well, the right part of, uh, of, of the picture to the left uh, were radical projects, even though we cannot read it from this picture, but it can be read from uh, Locke's article. And uh, his argumentation also was that uh, the radical projects were not uh, focused uh, or directed to uh, markets where we would already have a dominant foothold. Actually, it maybe should be because the projects itself, they were radical, so maybe we should build them on uh, or the potential profitability to uh, uh, so more solid foundation and not on uh, markets where we had have very weak position or already in the beginning. Well, this explains uh, uh, the uh, different uh, ideas that we might have when uh, managing um, portfolios or projects uh, at the firm level. And it is very typical that uh, uh, many projects are focused on improving the existing and not very many projects are focused on really bringing uh, us to new areas. Maybe the projects are too tightly aligned with the strategy or maybe we are uh, too much caught up uh, with the existing customers and uh, providing services to them uh, and that's why uh, the uh, renewal is not that easy. It also might be that because middle managers might uh, make decisions of investing in certain uh, new pro projects, so it can be that the middle managers don't have courage to invest in uh, projects that are really uh, not aligned with strategy, but that could renew the strategy. So it is not necessarily a middle manager's task to change the company. And if uh, there is a communication distance or filters or something uh, with the top executives, so it can be that we don't have those courageous decision makers present that can really take on uh, really big renewals in the company. Um, to continue with uh, this Locke's uh, study, he recognized uh, that uh, there were three kinds of processes how these projects were selected to the portfolio. And the three different processes uh, are the following. Now look at this slide. Formal process, pet projects and under the table projects. Formal process means that uh, the projects were evaluated according to systematic uh, 
project uh, prioritization or selection criteria. Uh, maybe they used uh, a stage gate process or a like, still a rather systematic way of uh, uh, assessing, assessing the project, assessing, assessing the projects and making decisions on them and selecting them to portfolio. Then um, number two, pet projects. Those projects uh, had a very strong sponsor from uh, the upper management level, and because the upper management executive uh, sponsored this project and uh, uh, was uh, in favor of its advancement, uh, there was no need to put this uh, project to the formal process and start evaluating it, because uh, the strong uh, sponsor who had the authorization to uh, resource the project and run the project forward, so had made the decision that this project is made for the company's future. And then the third uh, process was uh, under the table projects. The projects that were kept under the table. They might have been rather early ideas on, or still uh, further developments, but uh, uh, the lower level management, the kind of a departments um, or teams just did them and uh, they were hidden from uh, the management in a way. They just uh, had a strong belief uh, in, the, in those developments, but they couldn't uh, bring them to formal process because those projects would probably have been killed in the formal process, because they were of so uh, new ideas, so uh, let's say radical in a way compared to, for example, um, existing products, or uh, they were not aligned with the strategy. And that's why uh, the people at the lower parts of the organization, at lower levels, needed to just advance them and not explaining the, uh, or bringing them to management decision making, but to take them a little bit further so that uh, la they later on probably could survive uh, the selection process or formal selection process uh, uh, in an appropriate manner. Well, um, Locke didn't find any difference on the success of uh, these dif uh, projects uh, selected to the portfolio with these different uh, processes. And it's very understandable because uh, maybe appropriate processes were selected for each project in a way. And even in pet projects, it could be that uh, the top management took the responsibility of uh, making the future of the company and uh, even though uh, uh, the firm and its organization was not yet mature to uh, evaluate the project, uh, the um, top executive knew that uh, this will change our business and we will do it anyways, or we will open this card and see what it uh, brings. And also under the table projects might be justified uh, it happens that uh, uh, the lower level workers in a company, like project workers, project managers, they normally uh, work in the interfaces of markets. They work with customers. They also worked in, uh, work in uh, the technology interface and they know a lot. They know much more actually than the managers know and the problem might be the filters that we have of communicating from bottom to up and uh, the top level doesn't necessarily even understand. It might be that the lower level workers, they know even three 
four or five years before something uh, that the management only knows, top management only knows much later uh, because they are the lower level workers are in the kind of a front line. Well, um, having brought these things up uh, by using uh, Locke's study, I want uh, to um, show you a picture, this animated picture that uh, is uh, adapted and modified from Clayton uh, Christensen's uh, ideas about innovators dilemma. And the question is whether a project is urgent, whether we have a rush to do it, or whether it is important, or both. Well, we have here uh, a matrix, urgent, yes or no, important, yes or no. Well, these colored cells, cells with red color, uh, show urgent projects. So if the project is urgent and if it happens to be also important, it's good, it will be selected because there is urgency, uh, kind of a business urgency of doing it and so on. But if it is not important but urgent, it maybe will be done it will be taken to the portfolio and done, but maybe it is only a uh, loss of some investment money, loss of some costs, and nothing very dramatic uh, follows from that. But uh, the big issue is there uh, in that cell about uh, pro, uh, con concerning the projects that are uh, not urgent but important. So who is responsible in the organization of uh, taking on those projects and uh, taking them forward? So there is no urgency. Everybody, for example, is uh, uh, providing services for existing customers and uh, improving existing products. But it might be extremely important in uh, uh, in certain project to take the company to totally new areas and develop new customerships, new markets, new products, and thereby the project could be important. But there is no urgency or feeling of urgency at all because it is not aligned with uh, the company's current strategy. Uh, it uh, somehow doesn't feel very uh, significant to take on that because it's somewhere outside the company's current business. Well, um, there are all kinds of uh, issues that there might be in decision making that make the decisions very skewed. For example, uh, in Sauder's study, he found uh, that uh, if there are two types of projects, there are defensive projects and offensive projects. Defensive uh, try to build something that is uh, for hedging uh, the competitors' uh, moves and uh, uh, protecting somehow uh, our current business. And offensive projects would bring the company totally to some new area. So in an organization, the defensive projects, they feel like more important. It is not that the top management necessarily means that, but when they communicate about those projects, uh, the defensive projects uh, are so concrete because they can be con communicated in a concrete manner because there is a competitor that has done something and we must do something to kind of a respond to that and so on. So that the concreteness uh, gives 
uh, the whole organization and the project people a feeling of uh, strategic importance that this would be something really important to do and there we might come again to the kind of a uh, urgency issue that uh, we have a kind of a project that is uh, feeling like uh, being urgent uh, but offensive projects we don't have the results of them yet uh, they might be a little bit vague in the definition of the end product of the project and uh, in that way they might be very ambiguous and that's why uh, they might uh, feel not that important uh, either because they cannot, cannot be communicated by the top executives so clearly. Well, then there is also uh, this uh, lean money funding issue. So it is not necessarily very uh, kind of a beneficial if, well, not always be beneficial if uh, top management uh, puts a lot of resources to certain projects and uh, is overly generous in their funding. It might be much more effective to just to kind of uh, uh, have very uh, uh, kind of a small funding, lean money funding is that called, so that uh, it uh, means that the projects must uh, uh, develop their outcomes uh, with uh, having almost a continuous shortage of money. Uh, the reasoning is the following. Uh, if top management uh, pays attention to certain project, that is not necessarily very good or very much uh, reward bringing to the company. The top management might uh, uh, pour more money on that project and uh, explain in that way the project personnel that uh, the project is rather important. And the project personnel will be very flattered about this overly uh, general funding. And when the top executives ask for reporting from that project, uh, the um, project people feel obliged to give rather positive and good reports that yes we are doing fine we are really going to make something out of this and uh, thank you for the money and uh, we really are uh, uh, in exchange bringing you the great uh, outcome that uh, takes the company to uh, new profitability levels and uh, this leads to the top executives even put more funding to that project and the project people would be even more flattered and they would be even more reporting the good news to the executives even though actually the project might actually be rather bad and uh, not worth uh, funding at all. And sometimes uh, when we are talking about lean money funding so putting a small amount of money and even to have the uh, project to uh, live in a kind of a shortage of money sometimes it might uh, just uh, um, make a good drive in the project and, uh, and, and good results might even follow uh, from that kind of a approach also. Well uh, then uh, there are all kinds of uh, biases that uh, people can make when making decisions about uh, projects and their prioritization. Uh, for example, the sunk cost effect. So if we have invested so much in this project, so why not invest more? So kind of a throwing good money after the bad money, even though we can see from the status of the project that uh, it could should be killed and there is no justification of uh, and reason to 
put one single euro more money on that so that it doesn't uh, bring it back in exchange. <clears throat> well, uh, these issues are also connected to timing of projects. And in this picture, in this animated picture, uh, we have the innovation matrix for technologies or products. And typically in product development, we have uh, these two dimensions. There is a technology dimension that is kind of the product, can we make it? And there is the market dimension, the required availability in the market is here in, the, in this picture. And the technology dimension is uh, here uh, divided into uh, technology uncertainty, sorry, is here divided into uh, well understood, proven and not proven. And then uh, in the horizontal axis we have uh, the required availability in the market. So we should have the product in the market from five to ten years from now three, five years from now, or one, two years from now. Okay, now, here are our missed opportunities. So if we have a well understood technology and uh, we only are uh, bringing it to the market from five to 10 years from now, so that is a missed opportunity. Others have uh, taken the markets already. Uh, here, if we have not proven technology, we have a problem if we try to take uh, the product to the market from one to two years. And here is a kind of a, our future, some kind of a balance where uh, we develop some technologies uh, and, uh, and if we really have non-proven technology we must conduct research projects uh, and it takes a long time to get it to the market. And then uh, if we have well understood technology, if we have developed them to the well understood level, so then we are ready to make a market launch product, pro uh, project or a concrete product development project that takes it to the market in one to two years. Well, um, uh, this also connects to project portfolios in the following way. So if we have in the same project we have research and then very concrete uh, product development that uh, tries to take the product uh, to the market, um, a good advice is that we should split the project into two or three parts where we have a research project, then technology development, and then uh, a rather uh, short term or quick uh, new product development project. And we must run each of these projects separately and uh, by using different management methods. If we try to do it all in the same project, to do research and take the product to the market and uh, manage it all and uh, still have some unrealistic uh, time horizons there, so uh, it might be that uh, the project personnel and even the company uh, managers would be frustrated from trying to do something that they even cannot understand what they are managing. The project's uh, objective is not clear. But splitting it to different parts uh, clarifies it a lot and also gives us the means to uh, manage each of these projects successfully. This, uh, the story and the idea from this picture, it is explained also in this next picture in a way this is the Philips Blue uh, Box model and uh, there is a research long term, technology development mid term and product development uh, short term. And uh, uh, the idea is that uh, first there 
when we have an idea, we have also rather high uncertainty. And we are trying to do research to understand what is possible. And it might take five to ten years to find it out uh, research-wise. Then in the middle, this blue box is, uh, can we do it? Three to five years, and uh, we have a significantly lower uncertainty there. And then finally, uh, one to two years uh, from taking it to the market, we can ask and how we can do it. Uh, and then the uncertainty is even much uh, lower there. So, um, we were talking about different project types and uh, there are different planning horizons there. So, this is what we did, this is what we talked about and uh, it's good to understand the project portfolio management from the point of view of these project types, different time horizons and also different uncertainties that are involved in those projects. Thank you for being with me in this lecture. Looking forward to seeing you in further lectures. Bye.